status quo reigned, but the Dashka really like it? Pau came up with a big win when it absolutely mattered against Real Madrid, and it's a double round of action ahead in Euroleague. It's all ahead of us in Sweet 16. Tune in. Hello and welcome to the 17th episode of Sweet 16, an open look on Euroleague basketball. As always, with me, my great friends and co-hosts, both Emmett from Ballin Europe, Ari's from Eurohoops. Hi guys, how you doing? Good evening, afternoon, morning, whenever you're watching or listening to this from Dublin, Ireland, where Ballin Europe Tower is looking a bit cleaner than usual, I think, if you're watching the video. And hello from Athens, as we are trying to predict the future here and uh, think about what will happen uh, in the playoffs. Uh, we're already uh, in April, at least in our mind. So, Ahmed, as you uh, suggested, you know, in the intro part, you said that the status quo continues, but it wasn't just the status quo of the, uh, you know, the bottom uh, uh, part of the standings, you know, regarding to the top eight, uh, as also to the, you know, first three uh, uh, ranked teams with Olympiacos losing as well as Madrid and Cheska the same weekend. What are the odds? If you'd asked me at the start of the season, I'd have said wild and crazy, but given the way we've seen upsets go so far, Moshe, it's almost not surprising that all three lost in the same round at this stage. Uh, in terms of what the impact was, of course, it does mean no one in the top three changed their positions, and Fenner gained ground despite their injury worries increasing. We're going to talk a bit about that as we move on. And for the race for the last, well, four slots essentially now, it's no change, and that's but worse news, of course, for the one team on the outside looking in Dashka, as time is quite frankly running out for them. So uh, that's, you know, all ahead of us. And uh, we're going to break down how all that happened and what it means in our continually erroneously named Four Minute Warning. Four minutes to get through all the action that just happened in EuroLeague. It's the Four Minute Warning. And as ever, the four minute warning isn't quite four minutes, but, you know, it's that time of season where there's too much to talk about, folks. So. Maybe let's call it the 4 by 4 minute warning in this case. This week on the 4 minute warning, you know, last week we were kind of moving between times and episodes, especially because both Ahmed and Ari said that getting a best of 5 playoff series between Madrid and Panathinaikos would probably be a good idea. It will be something that we could all benefit from. We're going to get at least 3 different games that are going to simply deliver a high intensity basketball with a lot of adjustments, a lot of uh, strategies and adjustments pretty much i like to say adjustments when it's come when it comes down especially to a best of five series but this game was very special uh to begin with real madrid's backward i can say that in terms of delivering scoring wise they could have done better but from the tip off something was off madrid could not find the rhythm even though they had a few scoring runs it was just not their night uh for me and I think for you guys as well, as we talked about Borussis a few episodes ago, that play uh, and one of the last possessions of him getting the ball in the high post uh, to the right side, I think it was, with Singleton simply, let's say, slashing to the basket, moving without a ball. Borussis performing yet again as a sort of a point center, as we described him uh, uh, in past episodes, you know, pretty much sealing the, de the deal. I mean, this game was definitely one for the ages and I could not wait like I really wish to have uh, a playoff series between Panathinaikos and obviously Madrid I mean I want to flip it off to you how did you see this game what are uh, you know just share with us yeah Moshe like there were a few things quite like a good old Barney and Yoaka like when power in a close game and it's actually good basketball it's generally great for the neutral to be honest like for me it was just you know vintage sort of you know good old tussle down there like it's one of the, the cooler places to watch from a tv set really which is an odd way of putting it uh, in terms of just taking in sort of you know the real crisp crunch battle that was going on it was and it was good basketball like it wasn't bad basketball so uh, when a close game's actually got good ball going on like it's pretty cool to watch uh obviously man who's definitely more of an expert on this side of the, the, the fence than me though Aris, like, what was your take on sort of, you know, how basically did Pau win this game, essentially? For me, this this was a very interesting game because uh, I believe that this is the game that kind of completes the t transformation of this season's uh, Panathinaikos. Panathinaikos started as a team that wanted to play fast, that wanted to push the ball, that wanted to run and play up-tempo. Uh, this, this is not the case when you have on your bench uh, Coach Pascual. Coach Pascual wants to control the tempo, wants to play set basketball. And uh, against Real Madrid, against uh, Coach Lasso, against a, an opponent that he knows pretty well, uh, his team achieved uh, what uh, very few believe that 
he can achieve in such a short time. Uh, this was a, gay, a, signature, a signature game for uh, Pascual and Panathinaikos because uh, they really control the tempo, they pushed uh, on defense, uh, on dif- on defense uh, the backcourt of uh, Real Madrid, they really pressure the ball and uh, uh, in the offensive end it was also a matter of the individual talent of uh, Panathinaikos player. Of course, uh, this doesn't mean that uh, Pascual who has uh, uh, a number of set plays and many believe that he has the most set plays than any other coach uh, of Euroleague in his playbook doesn't want his team to produce as a unit but at this point he prefers to use the talent of his player and it was uh, for Sigleton and Mike James uh, one performance that uh, reminded uh, their last uh, season fits uh, when they got uh, to the final four with uh, Basconia and Lokomotiv Cuban so yes, Panathinaikos probably will not have uh, the home court advantage in the playoffs, but uh, they might be the harder opponent for any team with advantage. And of course, another team that's looking to be a hard opponent in the playoffs is Basconia. And we saw with that dramatic win over Sheska that the uh, almost truism now about Basconia, that they are basically a very different outfit when Toko Shengelia is healthy. Uh, came through yet again, like crucial win over Sheska, dramatic late finish. Uh, but uh, like you look at the the stats for Toko, like finishing with a twenty four PIR, and like when he's there, it's not just what he's doing in his individual game; it's what he's doing to make everything else work. That's sort of like he's the crucial part of the jigsaw, even when he's not the guy. Uh, Moshe, I suppose, like you know, Vasconia with Toko, it's it's a, it's a bit of a different story, isn't it? It sure looks like it. Um... But besides that, you know, I think that basically, uh, you know, Basconia just needed the win more than Cheska, to be honest. It was much more important for them for their playoff fight because a loss in that specific game. And, you know, everyone starts talking again, you know, maybe Basconia are not as good. It gave them a bit of serenity, but not long-term serenity, obviously, because they're going to have to step up and bring their A-game uh you know, through what's left of this season, uh, if they want to make it at the Final Four, uh, back-to-back years. Uh, Cheska, when you look at the game, you see that Milos arrived, uh, which is good news for them. Kyle Hines had more than a solid game, which is also good. You know, the loss for Cheska, since that both Madrid and Olympiacos lost, didn't mean much for them. You know, they're going to find the rhythm again. And, you know, they are looking, I think, more and more towards the playoff. With obviously, you know, they are pretty much set their eyes and their sights on the first, uh, you know, on the on the first place of the standings, and they're gonna have a good chance, I think, uh, after this last double week of games, as we're talking, uh, uh, is gonna end. Aris, how did you see those games? I mean, specifically Cheska coming to the Fernando Buesta Arena, but still not managing, you know, not quite succeeding to impose their will at the end of 40 minutes of great basketball. You know, that's uh, half part of the story. I want to give credit to Basconia. And as you say, uh, with uh, Senghila having an almost perfect game, uh, this is a demonstration of how this team works as a unit and uh, has uh, uh, found the solutions without one of the main offensive weapons of the team, Andrea Bargnani who is so far uh, more absent than present in every team's game. You have uh, Chase Battinger, who made uh, an amazing dunk and also was there when the team needed him. And you have uh, one of the unsung heroes of Euroleague, who is having a a great season. Adam Hanga is uh, the heart and soul of this Basconia team. And when Hanga is performing well, everything is clicking. For the rest of the team, and of course you have Shane Larkin who stole the ball in the end, and uh, he, he's the, the the guy who can give the extra push that is needed in order to make upsets uh, like this happen. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I believe that Cesca uh, uh, Moscow is kind of out of sync for some weeks now, but th- this is only natural. This is a team playing phenomenal basketball for almost two seasons and uh, they might have the luxury to relax a little bit because 
getting into the final stage of the season and making the, their final push. Nando De Colo is having once more an amazing season. Uh, he's by far since uh, 2016 the best French player in the world and that means a lot when you have uh, French national team teammates who are competing in the highest level of the NBA and uh, uh, Milos Teodosic after his uh, latest injuries he is just getting back into his real shape and to his uh, uh, natural self. Uh, I believe that uh, it's only a matter of time before we see Ceska Moscow clicking again and uh, uh, finishing the things off like they should. I'm not saying that they are unbeatable, I don't say that this win uh, might not cost them because at this point nobody knows how the top uh, seeds will end up with uh, four games left but uh, I believe that uh, that night and that game belonged uh, first and most uh, of all to Basconia. You know, you've mentioned uh, Milos and I totally agree and I think it's Milos's birth- birthday by the way so uh, we're gonna say just happy birthday to Milos, shout out from uh, Tel Aviv, obviously from Dublin and Athens as well. Um, obviously Cheska are, you know, they're gonna need some time to get back together and but we've had some other great games and Aris, I want to go back to you with asking, you know, after the game of Olympiakos hosting Galatasaray, uh, you posted on Facebook saying that Galatasaray this year beating Olympiakos two times, this is something that is probably, uh, that could have been an episode on the X-Files. I couldn't agree more. I was surprised to be honest, Olympiakos opened the game great, but what happened in your opinion in the second half that brought uh, Olympiakos to be simply manhandled by Galatasaray who I think won the second half uh, by uh, almost 20 points if not more? Yeah, something like that. Uh, what happened was that uh, Olympiakos just stopped playing. They believed that after one half uh, they had the game in the bag and they needed uh, no more effort or at least no effort at the highest level. And uh, add to that the fact that uh, uh, Spanulis played uh, after uh, being under the flu and uh, having high fever and uh, the game, the amazing game of uh, Mitsov and uh, you see what happened. The fact is that Olympiakos so far, despite being in the top three and already qualified to the playoffs, have uh, lost more games than any other top team to the teams that have already disqualified from the playoffs. So it's a little bit strange and uh, I, I don't say that it's a lapse on the team's mentality but uh, uh, it's something that uh, Olympiacos should be more concentrated from now on. The, the good news from Olympiacos is that, is that from now on they have to face only good teams, so they should be concentrated. Yeah, like right now, Gala seem like the uh, party spoiler already made for the last four rounds of the season. Like, you know, doing the double over Olympiacos obviously is like, you know, a great result for them considering the way their season's gone. And they seem very up for these final four rounds, like despite having to, you know, they're being pretty workmanlike in the BSL, uh, but, you know, they're obviously looking at EuroLeague as, you know, they're only one win away now, I think, from double digits. So if they get that 10th win, they'll obviously be happy. And what that could come against Arusha Faka, which would obviously be very interesting. And they've got a couple other games coming up now where, like, they're not going to the playoffs, but they could influence the final standings. And I think it's a little bit of a, eh, let's see what we can do here. Let's see if we can, you know, just be a little bit of a source of chaos. Uh, speaking of, a team which had an option to be a source of chaos, but just wasn't, uh, Milano. Uh, they took on Zvezda, and as expected, they lost to Zvezda. So, pretty straightforward there. Moshe, obviously pretty straightforward for Zvezda, even though it was close enough in the end. FS, workmanlike against Maccabi, I think it's fair to say. Oh, without a doubt, but I do think that, you know, FS came to this game uh, in a way kind of panicking um, after their loss as they were exposed versus uh, Bamberg. So this win was important for them, but they still have yet to impress in, des- to impress, uh, in that specific win. Uh, coming to this very, very critical week, uh, we will need to follow them as... Obviously, I don't think that the ability that they've shown and the consistency that they've shown in their last two games would be sufficient, and this one could be dangerous. Absolutely, and the other team, of course, who is uh, 
hoping, hanging on by a thread, we haven't even mentioned as a playoff contender, but did get a win because they are still theoretically won. Zalgiris got it. They just about got over the line against Kazan. So they're still alive. Huge week coming up for them as well, I think. Exactly like that. And you know, it was a very, uh, the way that the game ended was very uh, uh, interesting. Keith Langford again with him, you know, they were very close to uh, Zalgiris, but Leo Vesserman sang that amazing uh, three point from way, way deep. We got things covered and uh, as he got things covered and done, we can say that the four minute warning is done for this week or at least for this episode, moving on to the next. The Coach's Playbook, where we look at the strategies that worked and that need to work in the coming weeks in Euroleague. So this week in the Coach's Playbook, we're looking at an unusual situation. It's one that's come up quite a lot this year, and that is Fenerbahce's repeated injury woes. In spite of that, they're still at 17 and nine. They're better than evens by quite a broad margin to still make it as a top four team, get home court advantage. Right now, a 2-2 split in their final games, there's no way they don't get home court, plausibly speaking. I think there are mathematical possibilities there. Uh, a 1-3 split, they probably still get it. Uh, and a 3-1 split is entirely plausible, given their run-in. But uh, Aris, in terms of what we're going to see on the floor in terms of changes, the absence of Bogdan Bogdanovic, like what's the, essentially what's the challenge going to be for, uh, for, for Coach Zak? Like what's he going to have to do? Uh, this is a very interesting uh, question because... You have to couple this with the absence of Kostas Lukas. You have seen Fenerbahce without Bogdanovic, but with Lukas, and without Lukas and with Bogdanovic. With both of them missing, it will be very interesting to see how the team will react and who will uh, uh, take the slack. Uh, Scoring-wise, I don't think that uh, uh, Fenerbahce will have an issue. The real question is who will create for the big guys. This is the main issue, that without both Lukas and uh, Bogdanovic might be a problem. But uh, to tell you the truth, I'm not really seeing uh, Fenerbahce missing uh, the, top sp- uh, the top four. It will be very, very uh, uncharacteristic of a team uh, that's coached by Zelko Bradovic to miss uh, all the important uh, games that they have left. And uh, we have to say also that uh, They are having uh, uh, to play at home against uh, Barcelona and against uh, uh, Maccabi Tel Aviv. In both cases, Fenerbahce is uh, hands down the big favorite to get the win. And on the other hand, they have a very crucial game on the road, which is more crucial, I believe, for Anandolu FS than for them. So Fenerbahce is in a pretty good position right now uh, the team that may slip and miss the top four may be even if this sounds a little bit strange Olympiakos for Olympiakos suddenly the game on the road against Severna Zvezda is more than important because if they get this game then things are back on track again if they did uh, if they do lose this game then they have to host Real Madrid and this is their last home game and then they have to play against Anadolu FS in Istanbul and finish the season on the road uh, against Ceseca in Moscow. So Olympiakos probably will not have uh, will, will not be left out from the top four because uh, even if they lose all the four games uh, a team uh, either Basconia, Panathinaikos or Tsverna Zvezda have to win all their four remaining games in order to get over Olympiakos. So the Reds are in a very awkward position at this point. Uh, and be- because they have lost the game against Galatasaray. Uh, and that makes the, the contest against uh, Tsverna Zvezda very interesting for them because Tsverna Zvezda is one of the teams that are, are currently at uh, 15-11. It is one of the teams that can uh, still dream of making the top four. So. Uh, this is a big win coming, no matter how you see it. And uh, it gets bigger, even bigger for Anadolu FS and uh, Darius Afakadobus. Uh, in both of those cases, there is no room for error for either team. Uh, they, should, they will be playing and also watching what the other opponent does. Uh, Zalgiris, as you said, is near the line, but uh, I don't see them uh, making the cut, ultimately. Uh, even though they have... Uh, 
uh, they have every reason to be happy with themselves because of the, what they have done uh, so far. In theory, also Barcelona has some chances, but they are only mathematical. I don't see them making a miracle finish in the season and making it to the playoffs. So what we know for sure, and we will not probably know what will happen until the last game of the regular season, is how the playoffs will end up, how who, who will face who. Uh, we have a pretty good idea about which teams will have the home will probably have the home court advantage but we don't know yet and we will probably not know until the last uh, game is playing because the last game is uh, Cesca Moscow against Olympiakos who is going to be facing uh, who in the postseason and this makes things really interesting for uh, this Euroleague and this new format with four games left this is the first time that that we have uh, six teams Uh, which are mathematically out of the playoffs. It, it, it's a pretty good run for a new format which being, is being tested. And uh, many believe that uh, even at half season there, uh, there was a big chance that some teams will be indifferent. This is not the case. Well, I do think that, you know, going back to the Bogdanovich issue, it is substantial because last time he was uh, absent due to injury, uh, We waited and we asked ourselves how big of a performance uh, does James Nunnally have to give uh, in order to make up for uh, uh, for Bogdanovich not being able to play. And in some games, you know, he delivered in some not as much, uh, in others not, not as much. And I do think that this is a big question because that's true that they are uh, favorites versus Maccabi. But they did show some uh, vulnerability versus Maccabi's athletic lineups, uh, which are kind of lacking right now, to be honest. Uh, I would expect Fener to win, but they could get in trouble when, they're, uh, when they are facing Anadolu. And, you know, if, just if, obviously it's a big if, but should they lose a couple of games, then now we're talking on a completely different situation. They can end up losing uh, uh, their home court advantage. Highly unlikely, but still it is possible. It is possible. I don't know, you know, how big of a chance it has, but it's like Ari said, they are missing both Slukas and uh, Bogdanovich. And as they, as we saw Dixon delivering, coming big uh, for them in Freak City, can he deliver, can he deliver back-to-back games or back-to-back-to-back games? I don't know. I don't know. And we, we do have to adjust to the idea that When Slukas is going to come back, he's going to need the time to get back into rhythm. Same with Bogdanovich. So they are losing probably, I think, their, one of their best one-two punch in terms of, of specific lineups. And it's like Ari said, it will affect the big men. So they will have to, uh, to step up their game big time, especially in this week. This is a critical week. And we've talked about Jalgris. I think that even, the, uh, even though that Anadolu beat Maccabi, There is a scenario in which Jalgiris will take uh, Anadolu's spot in the, in, the, in the playoffs. And it is rather, uh, I don't want to say, uh, uh, you know, it, it's not that difficult to imagine, but it is highly unlikely. Uh, well, first, Jalgiris have to beat Anadolu for that to happen. It means that at the end of the regular season, should um, the number eight spot go to It will be, you know, there will be a tie uh, in the number of, win of wins between Anadolu, uh, Dachka, and Jalgiris. With Jalgiris getting the, you know, the, the tiebreaker with a double win over um, Ephes, then it means that they're going to take their spot because they are tied with Arushafaka and in a, a three way uh, uh, standoff, they get the edge. So they still have a shot. They have a shot, not that big, but possible. We have seen miracles happen, and we have seen Sharas making miracles. So, you know, who knows? It can happen. Again, very difficult, you know, what's going on right now in terms of rankings. That's true that I think that if Olympiakos will survive uh, the last remaining games, which two are extremely difficult versus the number one and number two seed, and we're, we're up for, for a treat from them. I mean, 
this is, you know, this, this could be something that could be a start of an amazing run. Because even the, if they can take down Madrid or Cheska in the last game, just think about the, you know, how good it will do to them in terms of morale, in terms of, of simply getting the confidence coming to the playoffs. Absolutely. Speaking of the confidence part, we're going to look now at a man who's been playing with a lot of confidence, but not getting a lot of love in the Scouts Notebook. And now it's time for the Scouts Notebook, where we look back at key performances during the week in the early to see who stood out and why. So, one guy, and I suppose it's almost de, de rigueur, I suppose, now, really, with Zalgiris players who's flown under the radar, because Zalgiris guys just tend to be flying under the radar this season, is Paulius Yankunas, who uh, just absolutely went crazy there against Kazan when his team absolutely needed him to go crazy against Kazan and uh, like you know there's been a lot of guys who stood up when it's mattered for Zalgiris this year like they may not have a winning record but that's the reason they're still competing and his performance is like Yankun is there like he's had a pretty darn good season now this was an exceptionally good night don't get me wrong but he's one of those guys who again it's like oh right he actually is a EuroLeague level player not just you know a bit of glue on the sideline or whatever and I suppose again it's like you know we've been like you know praising Saras all year for his extraordinary coaching job with Zalgiris but he clearly just knows this roster so well and he knows what he can get out of these guys and he's getting so much and we saw it again with Yankunas I suppose Aris that's the thing like you look at a Yankunas and we've seen it before with other Zalgiris players like it's guys we knew had some talent but didn't think they could do it this well this often I suppose is the biggest selling point with someone like Paulius you know Paulius is an icon. <laughs> there is no other way to, to put it. And uh, he he's a Euroleague icon, not just for Zalgiris. He's one of the players who stayed to one club and uh, uh, followed it throughout the, their career, had their ups and downs. Zalgiris, during Yankunas years, dominated the Lithuanian league, which is pretty important for every uh, team. To, for every club to dominate uh, their uh, local league and uh, uh, they did make a splash in the Euroleague they are, they are considered one of the Euroleague fixtures no matter what and uh, that's why they are uh, awarded uh, an A license uh, you can say that uh, Zalgiris uh, couldn't uh, repeat the miracle of uh, 99 winning the title but uh, maybe this is too much to ask in the modern era of Euroleague where you have uh, all those uh, rich, let's face it, teams, uh, picking talent from the NBA and uh, uh, having uh, the luxury to select uh, among uh, players who are either NBA bound or uh, marginal NBA players and uh, having uh, to compete with them based uh, mainly in, on local talent. Having said that, uh, Zalgiris on 99, ha uh, on 99 had Anthony Bui and Tyus Edney who are more than respected in NBA level talents uh, so the times are changing uh, and Yankunas uh, is one of those guys that uh, stand the, the change of time and uh, led Zalgiris to the highest possible point I believe that if he decides that this may be his last season and I don't think that he should decide that but because nobody can beat time if he thinks that uh, this season might be his last uh, it will be a great farewell because uh, even though Zalgiris has some great young talent uh, uh, local and also players like Leo Westermann or uh, Kevin Pangos who are making things happen Yankunas is uh, always uh, the focal point of Zalgiris uh, both on and off the court it's, it's just amazing absolutely and I suppose like you know playing for the second most Irish team in EuroLeague. It's great to see Polly is still doing it at this age. And on that note, uh, we're hopefully some of you got that on Twitter last week. Uh, we're going to move on to the games of the week, which uh, obviously they'll girls be hoping for yet another big game from Polyus and a few other of the guys. So let's get to them. It's the games of the week. Well, it's sort of two games in a week. It's double round week. So games of the week time. The past is in the past. What's done is done. It's time to look forward. Here's our games of the week. Well, this week on the Games of the Week, and yes, we are saying Games of the Week because this is the last double games week we're going to have in the EuroLeague uh, for the 2016-2017 season. 
And I want to start off with Cheska, Darushafaka, a great game in the making. Uh, in the first round, Darushafaka managed to beat Cheska, and then Dekolo got hurt, got sidelined for over a month. Uh, this time, I think it's going to be different because for Cheska, it's pride. From what I remember, they do not like to lose twice to, a, to the same team in one season. Especially, you know, they do not want to let Darushafaka get any funky ideas in their minds on uh, one hand. Um, also, besides that, uh, Darushafaka will come to fight for, the li for their lives. And as Ari said, week in, week out. And I totally agree, every week for Darushafaka is do or die. Now, they cannot lose this game <laughs> at all. So they will have to find, you know, the strengths within themselves, whether it's mentally or physically. If it was Wanamaker who played with a, a sprained ankle uh, this week, uh, allowing them get the win, which was obtained kind of in a hard way, uh, even though, uh, you know, they got the job done uh, uh, eventually. It's, uh, well, we got to admit, it's going to be, they're going to try and, and use their one-on-one -on -one advantages. We're going to see, obviously, a healthier Cheska with Milos in a better form as time passes by. But Aris, I would love to hear what your thoughts on this game because, well, for me, it's kind of a deja vu, I got to admit. Because last time these two teams met, I know, but I'm talking last season, Cheska crushed them. So in Russia versus Dachka, take it from here. I totally agree with you. On the fact that uh, th this is going to be a great duel, but uh, I really don't believe that Cheska is going to drop another game after losing uh, to Basconia, especially at home. And uh, you have also to, to take into account the fact that uh, after the game uh, against Basconia, Cheska Moscow is preparing for the game against Tarusafaka. They they don't have anything else to do. Uh, they don't have a VTB league game. So they will be more than uh, concentrated. Uh, the key game for this week is uh, Zalgiris hosting, uh, for the first part of this week, is Zalgiris hosting Anadolu FS. And I believe that uh, this is going to be probably the most interesting game. And it's funny because it's almost the first game played on Tuesday. Uh, Zalgiris needs this game to stay alive. And if they get it, uh, that means that Anadolu FS uh, is losing and that uh, Darusafaka is getting closer to the playoffs. But uh, they have to beat Cseseka in Moscow, something that I really don't see how it may happen. You, you never say never. But uh, this will be more than hard to do. And then you have Darusafaka hosting Galatasaray and uh, Anadolu FS hosting Olympiakos. So, uh, because those games are really back-to-back uh, -back games uh, with the teams not having time to re really recover but taking things uh, as they are uh, the test for both playoffs contenders will be more than interesting uh, in theory Anadolu FS has a better chance uh, the fact that uh, Darusafaka is facing Galatasaray and uh, this is an opponent that uh, uh, th those two opponents know each other pretty well because of their connection in the Turkish BCL uh, makes things uh, e even more trickier than uh, they really are. Uh, I, I see... I, I, I really hope that uh, it doesn't get to that because that will mean that uh, the playoff race may end up earlier than expected but uh, uh, Darusafaka will be uh, content if they get one win this week and uh, after Galatasaray beating Olympiakos and having no pressure at all I believe that they are more than dangerous uh, against an opponent that will have all the pressure in the world especially if they are coming from a, a defeat in Moscow uh, and I, I don't think that this really matters for the players but uh, have also in the back of your mind that uh, Darusafaka and Galatasaray will probably not be part of the Euroleague next season. And uh, there is a really big talk in Turkey that uh, Dogus will not be the future sponsor of Darusafaka. They will probably have a deal with Fenerbahce. Uh, so uh, th there is a lot of sad plots and many things piling up for uh, 
Fenerbahce for uh, sorry for Darusafaka and I believe that uh, this is the week that uh, the team should respond to to the pressure and uh, I'm not sure that uh, being a realist like coach Blatt uh, will have will not have on, on the back of his mind that the must win game is the game against Galatasaray so maybe we will see uh, Darussa Faka uh, trying to play as good as they can against Jessica Moscow but if the game goes wrong then they will probably try to focus directly into the next game because the next game against Galatasaray will be for sure a do or die game Absolutely, like a win in Moscow for Dashka would be huge but a win against Galatasaray is absolutely fundamental but of course the other pairing in this sort of three-way dance we've got going on is Zalgiris and Efes, which are playing, as as Aris was saying, they're in one of the first two games of the week. And, like, if Zalgiris win this, and that's a seriously plausible, you know, scenario based on what we've seen in the last two rounds of action, then they're only, uh, you know, then they're a lot closer than they were. You know, they're only, like, a game behind Fenner, say Efes. And, like, you look at the second round of games this week, Dashka get Gala. Okay, you favor Dashka, but it's not a sure thing because there are no sure things in EuroLeague. Efes get Fenner. You probably favor Efes because of the scenario, but at the same time, don't assume it would Efes win. And Zalgiris travel to Maccabi, which again, nothing's guaranteed, but that's about as winnable a road game as they could hope for in a double round week. And suddenly Zalgiris could actually be very much alive if the breaks go their way on the first two days of action. So... Like, it's going to be a fascinating week because we're either going to see Zalgiris completely gone, uh, Efes in a superior position, or and, and, and Dashka possibly not moving, or we'll just see everybody go 1 1 and we'll be back where we started with uh, next week's episode. Although, actually, 1 1 splits would probably be the end of it for Zalgiris as well. Uh, so, yeah, fascinating week ahead with all those games around that end of the table. Moshe. Like, you're looking at sort of those three teams. Um, what else is going on this week? Like, what are you seeing happening? You know, I want to quote Mitsov, if possible. We like to mess things up. Now, this is by far the best quote I've heard from a player, to be honest. Now, they know, Galatasaray, that their run in the EuroLeague has come to an end. And in a way, a tragic end, for that matter. So, i got to say, if... Dachka loses two, and Anadolu are capable of losing both games because, well, they are coming to uh, count us. They are coming to play at the Jalgeri, or, uh, the Jalgeri Arena where the Lithuanian fans, I don't think that they would let Ephes play in a quiet uh, environment, okay? They will not feel serenity throughout the game. Now, we've seen Sharas coach the hell out of games okay so i'm saying you know it's like you said guys by the end of this week uh, maybe a couple of more a uh, couple more teams will find themselves outside the playoff run okay uh by the way shoot on a dolu win it means that either way um barcelona's mathematical chances are done uh, so that's pretty much it but i really like to see jalgiris at least win the first game with uh, against FS and Dachka uh, lose not because I want teams to lose I just want things to get much much more interesting and I think this is the best way possible to get them as interesting as possible and you mentioned Barcelona there and I expect them to be out of the running this week formally but the two games they have this week could actually have major implications for the higher end of the seedings in the playoffs first of all and I'm reading off our script notes here what we're describing as the saddest El Clasico ever, which will say a lot considering what the previous El Clasico in EuroLeague this season was like, uh, playing away to Real Madrid. Obviously huge implications for the top two or three spots there in that game. Then they've got Corvina Zvezda, who are all but in the playoffs now. We're not quite there mathematically in terms of the maths, but we're very close in terms of saying congratulations, welcome to the postseason, Zvezda. And again, that's Zvezda going to Barca, and you're kind of going... Win for Zvezda there, and if, you know, what I was describing here in the show with the Olympiaca situation, could make things interesting for that top four. So, yeah, like, that's actually, I suppose, like, because I know we're jumping all over games here, and I'm going to push it back to Iris. One of the things, and you've been hitting on it in multiple episodes, it's been kind of reassuring to see how many games matter 
this late in the year. Because uh, with uh, this kind of format, uh, th- there was a real danger of uh, this not happened. And uh, if somebody at the start of the season uh, will tell me that uh, Zalgiris will be with uh, four weeks left uh, in the playoffs race, uh, I I wouldn't just I wouldn't believe it. That's pretty much it for this week on the show. We've uh, got a pretty packed one, obviously, because it's a packed schedule. And so, well, first off, from Dublin, from Ball in Europe, it's farewell from me. As always, you can find me ballineurope.com, facebook.com slash ballineurope, and bie underscore basketball on Twitter. And uh, Aris, where can we all find you? Until next week and the next uh, Sweet 16 podcast, you can uh, bear with me on uh, the internet through Eurohoops and also through the social media as Al Barkas on Twitter and Aris Andreas Barkas on Facebook. Well, you can find me as always hiding or just simply watching the Israeli league games, whether it's in Tel Aviv or in any other gym, to be honest, because I will practically leave basketball. You know, I live within uh, this sport. Uh, but besides that, I do believe that every day is a Euroleague day and that you can find me on the social media platforms and Twitter with B one and I Am Team Scout on Facebook at I Am Team Scout. And you can find us all on your Hoops TV uh, channel on YouTube as we will upload this show, as always, to YouTube and, you know, SoundCloud and iTunes. But till next time. Sweet 16. An open look on EuroLeague basketball. Covering 16 EuroLeague teams. Gonna be sweet. Sweet 16.